So welcome everybody to a session organized by the American Economic Association and the American Finance Association on COVID-19, the economic implications and finance implications. I'm here with Jeremy Stein from Harvard, Sidney Ludwigson from NYU, and Nick Bloom from Stanford. We will discuss various economic aspects of uh, the COVID crisis. Welcome to everybody. And I would like to start with some opening remarks. So each of us will have about 20 minutes to give you opening remarks. And then we go actually uh, back to a second round and have Q&A in between. So if you have questions, please raise your hands and uh, you can either submit it in Q&A box or you can also, you know, or I can also unmute you for speaking up. So please be ready for that and ask your questions in between. So let me give you some opening remarks, which are based on a little booklet and the webinars I've organized and Jeremy and others and Nick were already on this webinar series as well. So I give a little bit of an overview, uh, what are the main economic takeaways from uh, the uh, COVID crisis. First of all, the COVID crisis was a moment of truth or a naked swimmer moment as Warren Buffett called it. So it revealed a lot of our shortcomings of our society. And we, it was also a trend accelerator. So many, many trends we have seen before, like online learning and many, many other things, online conferences would actually split up by the COVID crisis. But what I want to focus on here is very much on the concept of resilience, and which is different from risk. So where risk is a little bit of more about variance, you know, we know a lot about risk management, how to manage risk and all so forth and get rid of tail risk or manage tail risk. Resilience management is different. Resilience is about mean reversion. So it's inherently a dynamic concept. So it's about bouncing back. And you see this uh, roly poly toy, which you know you push and then it bounces back. So it's not about not being exposed to risk, but once you get hit, you can come back. It's about mean reversion. And that's actually very important to have a society which can handle uh, shocks and can also bounce back. And what's really dangerous is if you have traps. So once you hit, you're trapped and you can't bounce back or you have tipping points where you hit and then you uh, go further, further away rather than coming back, you fall into a hole. And what you have learned from the COVID crisis is actually not bad to have some redundancies. So you have some extra capacity which is sit sitting idle around rather than only focusing on productivity, productivity and cutting back all the redundancies. So just in time might not be the optimal thing, just in case might be a good way to deal with. And that's actually came up already in the first in the vaccine production. And when you look here at different vaccines, what you noticed here is that we developed many vaccines this is for various countries, how many vaccines they ordered. They ordered way more what they needed per person. So you see, for example, that's the number one. And Canada ordered eight vaccines per person, while UK ordered you know, around six. And that's essentially a lot of redundancies. You order way more what you actually need because the cost of producing a vaccine or also testing compared to a lockdown is tiny. Uh, you know, lockdown is way, way more expensive. So the first principle is redundancy. And the second principle is diversification. You would like to develop vaccines which have very low correlations. So that's essentially one thing you would like to have, have very, very low correlations. You might pick some vaccines which are mRNA vaccines. You have some other vaccines which have a different technology. So you don't pick only one technology of uh, these vaccines. So that's one thing. So you would like one lesson was redundancy is not a bad thing in general. You would like to, to keep this uh, uh, um, also some redundancy. The other thing is probably well, Nick will talk about this uh, a little bit further is also that uh, you will have through the COVID crisis, you will have long lasting effects. And some of the long lasting effects are innovations and other of the long lasting effects are scarring effects. So there are positive effects and negative effects. The positive effect is that, you know, the innovation might be boosted because we might be in some local optimum and to jump to, uh, to a global optimum, the COVID crisis might throw the ball out of this local optimum into a global optimum. And that's related to this famous QWERTY problem. If you know how is the keyboard arranged in our keyboards, it's this QWERTY arrangements, which was done because all typewriters had these different hammers and they're smashed. So that's how you are assigned the letters on the keyboard. But now, of course, we have all computers. So this rationale to assign the letters this way is not really there anymore, but we can't switch away from that. And some big shock like the COVID shock throws us off. And you see many, many other elements like online learning, digital money, home office, 
uh, and so forth, there will be some effects on this. And similarly, the regulatory shackles will be broken away. So you have a lot of telemedicine, which is suddenly feasible, uh, which was unimaginable uh, just a year ago. Now, these are the innovation effects, these are positive effects. Of course, there will be scarring effects, and uh, others will talk more about the scarring effects, in particular, uh, also, you know, debt overhang problems and other elements. But what's interesting, the Fed intervened quite dramatically in March 2020, and the financial markets had a huge shiver uh, in 2020 and a strong recovery. So you had the stock market, you know, shaking in March 2020, but coming back big time. So you have an IPO boom, which is bigger than the Nasdaq bubble in 1999 IPO boom. So it's huge IPO booms. You have the government bond, bond market, you have the government stepping in is a market maker of last resort in order to stabilize the government bond market. And you have the corporate bond market. And if you just look what I've plotted here, the issuance of corporate bonds is at record height. So in the corporate bond market, the government, the Fed is stepping in with the Treasury together to provide some backstop, didn't buy so much, but in the removal of this tail risk led to huge issuance of, of government bonds in the corporate bond market. And you know, very, very unexpectedly having this strong recovery, this whipsaw, where essentially it goes down and then whipsaws back very quickly. The other thing, what we have, of course, we have this huge increase in public debt. So we have this debt to GDP ratio, which is depicted in this figure. In the Second World War, of course, it peaked in the United States. But you know, we, we went up way, way high, almost 100% and beyond 100%, and this projected to go up way much more dramatically. But the big question, big debate, which was raised because of the COVID crisis also, is do we really have to focus on the debt to GDP numbers, or should we focus on debt servicing cost? And here, what I've depicted in the blue line is essentially what fraction of GDP is spent on interest payment by the government. And you can see, even though the debt level went up a lot, the interest payment did not go up because the interest rate is coming down, is coming down, and is coming down. And the question is, why is the interest rate so low for uh, the government debt? And that's, I think, a lot of interesting questions which were raised up, and they were important to handle the scarring effects that we have now, this huge uh, pub public debt levels and also private debt levels. And one reason why this interest rate might be so low is the safe asset component. So we need essentially a different way of pricing uh, government bonds and safe assets, where typically we just have the present value, the expected present value of cash flows, which in terms of government bonds, you can view as primary surpluses. That's what the government pays out ultimately to the bondholders, to the whole group of bondholders. But you also get some service flow. So that's the additional service flow, the expected present value of service flows. And what are the service flows? There's a safe asset component to it. And that's becomes because of this retrading. So everybody would like to save. Uncertainty is so high. It is incredibly risk. People face a lot of it is incredibly risk. They want to hold some government bond. If something goes wrong, they have some extra capacity to sell it to somebody else. And there's this retrading. And there's actually a bubble component that popping up. And that makes actually the asset price, the value of government bonds, very high. Or put differently, the interest rate that the government has to pay very low because you have this uh, second component in the asset pricing formula, which is a bubble component, and that's very, very important. Of course, the second component could also, service flow could also be that it's a, government bonds are very good collateral, so it relaxes the collateral constraints. The Lagrange multiplier is, is uh, showing up in the service flow calculation. But if it's a bubble component, and then the question is, of course, uh, this bubble component uh, has a bubble feature, and bubbles can also burst. Okay, And then uh, how stable is it? And that's why you need fiscal space on the government side to defend this bubble. So if the bubble were to burst, you have the capacity to defend the bubble and back up the, the government debt with, with taxes. Okay, At least in off equilibrium, you have to have the capacity to credibly sustain this bubble. And that gives you a different perspective about debt and how risky it might be, how the risk uh, the risk of sudden day low interest rate, which is not a big problem if the interest rate is low, the high public debt level, but if it were to jump, and what this jumping means is the bubble is bursting and then uh, you have to be able to back it up. And if you credibly can convey off equilibrium that you can do this, the bubble will never burst and hence uh, you can actually sustain this very easily. But if not, then not. <laughs> 
So we talked already about the financial whip. So that you know, in March 2020, the stock market, bond market, corporate bond market in particular, and also the 10-year U.S. Treasury market uh, went down, then recovered very strongly, especially IPOs and corporate bond issuance. There might be another whipsaw, and that's not obvious yet well it would play out this way, which I call the inflation whipsaw, where I said, you know, right now in the crisis, you have huge deflationary forces, which bring inflation down, possibly in negative territory, and you might be trapped in a deflation trap. That, you know, traps are resilience killers. They don't bring you back, you're stuck. There's no bounce back effect. But it could also be that later on, because of all these measures we're undertaking, leads to an inflation trap. So you may end up in high inflation. So there might be a danger of an inflation whipsaw. We have to analyze that too. So for this, uh, I would argue it's very, very important to have a very independent central bank. There's a lot of argument in the literature and also among policymakers why we don't need independent central banks anymore. And I would say you need it even more. You need more independence for central banks and you need more macro potential regulation now in order to control that you're not trapped later on in an inflation trap. And I compare it a little bit with a race car. So you need a lot of acceleration now but you can accelerate much more if you have good brakes in your race car that later on can put the brakes on. So you feel much more comfortable to put the accelerators on now, knowing that you have good brakes when you, when you need it later on, that you can break it down again. And these brakes are essentially independence of the central bank and good macro potential regulation. And I think that's very important to keep in mind. Now let me stop with the final slide and just say a few words about behavioral economics and behavioral finance. I think the COVID crisis was also fascinating from a behavioral economics and finance perspective uh, for two reasons. First, the first wave of the COVID crisis was very different from the second wave. The first wave, I would argue, it was all driven by fear. So we all talk about rationally about not internalizing externalities. I don't social distance because you're fully to the full extent because the benefit accrues to others, not only to me. And that's essentially why, you know, social distancing is not fully played out. But what you saw in the first crisis, if you compared, for example, Sweden, which had no lockdown or very limited lockdowns compared to Denmark or Wisconsin and Minnesota, you can also, they have different starting points of lockdowns. But if you look at the activity levels, actually it didn't make much of a difference whether the state was locking down the economy early or not. And people were afraid and had a huge fear in March, April 2020 and reduced economic activity dramatically, consumption spending, mobility measures, all of this went down dramatically and significantly. Independently of what the government was doing, the government was more signaling, was more, the lockdown was more a communication device, how serious the issue is. And whether it was done, the communication by the neighboring state or by the state itself didn't much do much of a difference. So the first wave was all driven by fear and anxiety. Now, the second wave after in the fall of 2020 was very, very different. I would characterize it as COVID fatigue or denial or fatalism almost, where people are much less willing to go and uh, do some social distancing. And the question why might this be the case that you know now they are much more willing to take the risk on this and one opt argument might be that you have some optimal expectations you don't really fully internalize all the dangers because you actually have some optimal beliefs you believe more optimistically that you will not be hit it might be hitting others uh, and much less likely you so you like to have anticipatory utility you like to like to believe that you not be hit and typically you become more realistic because you do make the uh, wrong decisions and the wrong decisions make your beliefs uh, then more realistic. But in this case, the decisions are not made by you, but by the government by imposing certain lockdown um, uh, features. So your choices are limited. Hence, you can dream more, you can be more optimistic about it. Or the choices might be made by others anyway through externalities. So you have very limited impact on your own health conditions, much, much more driven what the environment is doing because of these externalities. So you think I can actually be more optimistic, be more fatalistic and think I will not be hit. So let me summarize my few opening remarks. 
In sum, I think the COVID crisis will be remembered as one of the big events in this century. And also for economics and finance, a lot of new exciting research, a lot of avenues open up. It's fantastic to be a PhD student, be an academic at this stage. And so there are some long running innovations. So we have this QWERTY problem. We have a jump away from this QWERTY problem. Many things are opening up, but we also have scarring problems. And this, both of these long-run problems, we have to solve and figure out what to do about that. Instead of focusing on productivity, narrow concept of efficiency, just in time, making everything leaner, I think redundancies and resiliency and resilience is really the concept which is, has to be underexplored and has to be explored further. And there will be a new way of thinking about it. If you think about global value chains, it will be more dual or triple sourcing rather than relying on one uh, producer from one particular country uh, or resources you source from three different suppliers from three different continents. Now, what's about resilience is not about variance, it's not about risk. It's about even if you're hit, you can come bounce back. It's about mean reversion. It's a dynamic concept. And that's essentially very important. What you have to look out for is some traps or some tipping points. Once you're hit, you can't come back. Or once you're hit, you fall into a hole because you've reached a tipping point. And this dynamic concept, I think, will be much more important. And we have to incorporate in our economic and our finance research much more uh, clearly. So redundancy is a big concept. Of course, diversification is a big one. We have seen it in the vaccine developments as well. One thing which I didn't mention so much, 2008, it was very much about households and mortgages. The CARES Act in the United States was generous enough, so it made it less of an impact in, to the households uh, this year. This 2020 crisis will be much more about firms, uh, while 2008 was about households and banks and all this. Because of this aggressive intervention by the government sector, it will be this time around probably much more about firms, in particular small and medium enterprises, rather than on the household side and the banking side. And some observers say, OK, this was actually a lesson how we should have handled 2008. If we would have acted so aggressively in 2008 as we did in 2020, perhaps the great financial crisis would never have become such uh, a, I wouldn't say great big financial crisis uh, and recession. So I mentioned about the financial whipsaw and the inflation whipsaw. And you know, once you evaluate government debt, the safe asset component, has essentially a different asset pricing component, a second one, where the second one actually has a negative beta. So essentially it's a bubble component. And when they go in a crisis period, uncertainty goes up, the safe asset value goes up. And this first component has a positive beta, but the second component has a negative beta and it swings essentially the overall beta the other way around. And that gives actually then the asset, the safe asset feature uh, I mentioned earlier. So with this overview, I uh, would like to pass it on the floor to Jeremy, who will move first, and then Sydney. And after Sydney, Nick will uh, talk about working from home and other features. Jeremy, the floor is uh, yours. Okay, Marcus, thanks so much. And thanks for including me in this uh, session. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Okay. So uh, what I thought I would do is focus um, uh, essentially on the response of central banks and on uh, the, the, the Fed in particular, and touch on a few, a few particular elements of, uh, of what's happened over the past year. Let me, let me just advance this. Okay. Let's see. All right, so the first thing I wanna to touch on, and this is something that Marcus mentioned, is um, the an, uh, initiation, the announcement by the Federal Reserve in partnership with the Treasury of their corporate bond buying facilities. So this is, if you if you'll recall, back in March, there was really quite uh, dramatic turmoil in the corporate bond in both the treasury and the corporate bond markets. Um, there were there were dramatic, historically large outflows from open end corporate bond funds. Uh, very very pronounced upward pressure on credit spreads. It was looking <clears throat> for a week or so like we really might have something that was going to spin more or less out of control, like these outflows were going to start uh, feeding on themselves. The Fed stepped in <clears throat> first on March 23rd by announcing the primary and the secondary market uh, credit facilities. <clears throat> Excuse me. Those facilities were subsequently expanded 
um, in April when they got the backstop from the CARES Act. Um, Chair Powell throughout this was communicating. He made some remarks, I think Marcus may be at Princeton, um, uh, that were, were taken by the market as sort of very forceful where he talked about the Fed crossing, crossing various red lines. So uh, I think the first thing to say is this effort uh, or this part of the, the, the Fed's efforts were really just enormously important. Um, and I think when the history of all this is written, um, you know, they'll be seen as having really prevented uh, what was an economic and a health crisis from uh, essentially metastasizing into also a financial crisis. I think if they had, you know, there's a real reasonable argument to be made that if the Fed had not intervened in this way, we would have had essentially a crisis uh, or a near crisis in, in, in credit markets. And as Marcus said, you can, and you can see in the picture, you know, their interventions had these very powerful effects on credit spreads, maybe even more dramatically, he showed a picture uh, in the wake of that, there was huge issuance of, of private corporate bonds. So interestingly, the, the, the Fed's uh, facilities acted as a backstop. They really didn't buy much, but the fact that they announced them and announced this willingness to buy really, really calmed the private markets and allowed there to be a, a tremendous uh, uh, amount of private issues. Okay, so again, it was, I think, you know, a very sort of rapid, aggressive, forceful, and sort of on point policy, I think they deserve tremendous credit uh, for, for responding the way they did. I think with that said, I think it's interesting to sort of think about the market response and what could have gone or what could go, could go wrong in the future. So if you look at this, the response was across the credit spectrum. So first thing to note is there were very, you know, I, I, the, the picture I have here is uh, a relatively high rated bonds if you look at this for lower rated junk bonds, single B or C rated bonds, very large effects there as well, even though essentially the facility was not entirely, but largely aimed at investment grade bonds. You nevertheless got a sort of a very powerful effect. And these effects were so large that credit spreads fell not only relative to where they had been, but fell in many cases below unconditional non-recession averages. In the middle of, again, you know, it's, we're, we're, we're seeing light at the end of the tunnel now, but if you put yourself back in the shoes of the spring and early summer, when it looked like, you know, we were heading for a, you know, an enormous recession, those, those sorts of market reactions uh, were, were, very, were very strong. And I think there's an argument to be made that the market in some sense over-interpreted uh, the Fed's ability or willingness to step in. In other words, it's, it's quite reasonable to think that the Fed could step in and essentially ease market dislocation, ease market dysfunction. It's much harder to believe that they were going to ever make good uh, if, if a bunch of single uh, you know, B or C rated bonds defaulted. Yet these, these bonds were priced, and we, we did a little bit of analysis of this, they were priced as if, um, you know, if, if, if you believed that there would be typical recession level defaults, these bonds were priced in such a way that you'd expect negative returns, okay? It was just as if the Fed, as if the market heard the Fed say in a much stronger and more unconditional way, we've got your back. And of course, that was all to the good in the moment because that made the market response more positive, sparked more issuance. I think there was a risk. Um, now, because the vaccine has, has sort of come in a better than it might have been expected way, we probably won't realize this risk. I think there was some risk um, at the time that if we'd gotten more negative news, that the market was so elevated that, you know, had some bad news come in, it was really primed for a fairly serious crash. That if, you know, there had been a wave of downgrades and defaults, there would have been not only the bad news associated with those, but there would have been the market realization that, oh, the Fed doesn't have our back in the way that maybe we had been pricing in. So I think that there was some risk um, associated with that. Again, I think we won't, we won't really see that risk realized now that there's the light at the end of the tunnel um, with the vaccine. But it's sort of an interesting, it's an interesting sort of communication challenge in situations like this, where on the one hand, you want to be forceful. If you're a little bit too forceful, the market sometimes wants to hear it as complete backstop. And then you've, you know, you've got a little bit of risk. I think there's also a longer run issue here. Um, and that has to do with what is the pressure going to be 
to reform some of the weak spots that we've seen in markets. Again, I think the whole open-end bond uh, complex has shown itself to be a point of vulnerability, that you can get these very dramatic outflows and you have relatively illiquid assets and you can get fire sale and almost run-like effects in those markets. Um, thanks to the Fed's intervention, we didn't really get to run the full experiment. We didn't get to see what would have happened if there hadn't been this level of support. So now if you're the, if you're industry, you can say, well, look, you know, this all held up pretty well. And it's a little harder to make the sort of bluntest case that this is something that we really need to worry about. So I don't know if you want to call this a moral hazard, but I think we're going to probably have less reform and less correction because there's this notion, either because we didn't learn from this time or because there's a notion, correct or not, that the Fed might be around next time there's sort of event in in credit markets. So, you know, again, as, as much as I applaud um, their actions this time, one hopes that we don't become in some sense dependent on those actions going forward because we don't do the necessary sort of thinking about uh, strengthening the kind of resilience of the system uh, as, as, as Marcus alluded to. Okay, so that's, that's the first thing I wanted to touch on. Um, the second, kind of big aspect uh, of the Fed Treasury programs that, was, you know, that, that, that were announced were the so-called Main Street programs. These were designed to lend to essentially medium-sized and smaller firms. Um, and these basically really never got off the ground. Um, again, I think the damage associated with them not getting off the ground is less than it would have been, obviously, if things have been, if we hadn't had a vaccine and things had, had, had dragged on for longer. But I think if one looks back, you could sort of anticipate that these programs were not gonna be successful. Um, I think they were just designed in a way that wasn't fit for purpose here. Um, and you know, one, one way to think about it, at least the way I've sort of interpreted it, is that these programs were designed in a kind of classic lender of last resort fashion much in the way that the interventions were, were in 2008, 2009. Um, but this was not a classic lender of last resort situation. In other words, what's the classic lender of last resort? It's, you know, think of kind of a bank run type of situation where you've got fundamentally solvent institutions, but there's a liquidity crisis. So you provide liquidity. If you provide liquidity, you break the back of the bank run now you're left with a fundamentally solvent banking system and you can expect to get paid back. This is the famous Badgett dictum where you lend aggressively at a penalty rate and essentially expect to get paid back. That's how you deal with a liquidity crisis. This was not a liquidity crisis in the same way. This was a situation where we had irreducible macroeconomic uncertainty because we just didn't know what the progress of the disease was gonna be, what the progress towards a vaccine would be, and there's no amount of liquidity support that could eliminate that fundamental uncertainty, okay? So given that, if you were gonna provide the sort of support that was needed, it was going to be necessary, in my view, for the government, the Treasury and the Fed coalition to accept some risk of credit loss. You can't design it in a way that you know, you've sort of magically eliminated the bad equilibrium and you can expect to lose no money, okay? And the design really, and I, I, I think this was probably more so coming from the treasury side than from the Fed side because the, the treasury was the junior partner and was the one first exposed to, to losses. I think the design had too much of the, we're not gonna lose any money kind of aspect. Um, and there were a few program features. So the first was that any, any money that was to be lent under this program, there was gonna be side-by-side -side participation with banks. So in other words, for a dollar lent, the Fed would take 95 cents and the bank would lend five cents, but they would be on equal terms with one another, okay? In other words, that means no loan will be made unless a bank views it as a privately positive NPV loan. But if you think about what you're trying to do, you're trying to essentially, you know, solve for the fact that the planner, there is a wedge between what the planner sees as positive NPV and what the private market sees as positive NPV. And if you put the decision essentially in the hands of the private market, you will not get the kind of risky lending 
uh, that, that you need. Um, so the banks are gonna be a choke point in some sense uh, in, this, in, in, this, in this design. Um, related to that, there were relatively tight restrictions on firm leverage as a, a further attempt to manage credit risk and the terms of the loans themselves were designed again to protect the government state. They were relatively senior, in most cases collateralized. They had fairly rapid and demanding principal repayment schedules. These are all things you would do if you were determined not to lose any money. But again, I don't think that that's what the, the current situation um, called for. I think a better design would have been to essentially modulate each of these each of these features. So, you know, for example, if you were determined to have the banks involved, there's a way to still get some incentive compatibility, but to have some subsidy for the banks relative to the government. So for example, you could have said to the banks, well, if the loans are current three years from now, you will get more than your 5% share of the interest, right? You could have given them sort of a bigger cut conditional on the loan being current. So that would still give them incentive to do some underwriting, but it would allow for some subsidy, i.e. you would sort of respect the fact that there's a wedge between the way the planner sees this and the, and the private market. Um, again, if you think about the situation, if you, if you say, I'm gonna create a credit box such that only the most credit worthy firms get in, um, you're just not gonna be lending to those who need the funding the most. So I think an alternative way to control risk would be to have looser credit terms, but to stage the financing. In other words, that's, that's what the, the, the market does in situations of higher uncertainty in venture capital. You don't say in a venture capital setting, I'm determined to get my money back with probability one. You put out a little, you understand that it's risky. If things go well, you can put out a little bit more. And so staging is the means of protecting your investment rather than a very, very tight credit box. I think that, again, would have been a better design feature. And then finally, um, and Marcus uh, briefly mentioned problems with debt overhang. Again, designing this as very senior hard debt claims, again, seems problematic because the last thing you want to do is get on the other side of the pandemic and have these firms survive, but have them then teetering under a very, very heavy debt load. So I think all else equal, it would have been better to design these in a sort of softer way essentially more like preferred stock. So you don't have as much of a debt overhang problem. You're not risking putting these firms into distress. Now, of course, that last, last issue has never really kind of come to the fore because we just didn't get any financing or any meaningful uh, um, amount of financing out. Um, and again, uh, this won't be as damaging as it might have been, but I think you know at the time, if you sort of look back in hindsight, uh, this could have been designed better um, I think it would have been helpful if the Treasury was willing to accept the risk of loss. And of course, that's what the CARES allocation um, was, was, was designed to, to let them do. Okay, let me turn to the last um, issue here. Now, this is not really um, about the crisis per se, but it's, I guess, an interesting development in central banking uh, that happened, thanks, Marcus, that happened this year, which is the Fed's new policy framework. Um, so for those of you who follow this, they've made a couple of kind of changes to the framework. Um, one is loosely speaking, the idea that they're not gonna cut, I'm sorry, they're not gonna reduce accommodation preemptively just because unemployment falls below some notion of the natural rate. They're kind of gonna wait to see uh, the whites of inflation's eyes before, before raising rates. And, and uh, that's based on the idea that you know um, the the feedback um, the feed I'm sorry the the the, uh, the Phillips curve is very very flat and so just seeing low employment is not that low unemployment is not that reliable a predictor of, of, of inflation and then there's this idea of flexible average inflation targeting um, which is that you know after a long period where we've been a little bit below two percent inflation we're going to aim for a period of above two percent inflation. So as to kind of average, average things out, okay? I don't think this framework is um, sort of bites quite as much now, but I wanted to kind of suggest a situation where I think the difference between this and where we were will be particularly interesting. So think back to um, before the pandemic, think back to mid 2019. 
where the unemployment rate was very low, it was 3.5%. Um, inflation was a little soft, let's call it 1.7%, and the funds rate was at 24 Okay, so the question I guess I want to ask is, if, we're, if we ever get back to something that looks like this, where we're really at you know, a very strong labor market, we're at full employment, but inflation continues to be soft. In the new framework, do we have to basically uh, assume that the Fed won't sit there with a funds rate of two, two point something, but they'll say, you know, we have determined, we have committed that we're gonna get inflation not only to two, but a little bit above two, and we're basically gonna keep interest rates at zero, even with a very strong labor market until we see inflation actually above two. And if so, what are the advantages and disadvantages? And I think the perceived advantage um, is a belief, um, and this is sort of you know, a very common belief in, in sort of macro, that by sort of making this, this kind of commitment up front, you move expectations, and that by moving expectations, there is a feedback, you know, once we get people to believe that we're gonna be very strongly seeking inflation, price setting will you know, respond to that, and that will actually help us achieve the inflation. So that by in some sense, committing ourselves to this very aggressive, easy policy in this sort of circumstance, it will help us deliver, um, uh, deliver on, the, on, on, the, on the higher inflation uh, that's desired. Of course, the disadvantage is if you're committing yourself to doing this, okay, and we're in a world of a very fat, flat Phillips curve, you may have to do this pretty aggressively. You may have to administer a lot of hot labor market medicine um, and, and you know, easy monetary policy medicine in a flat Phillips curve world to move the dial much on inflation. So in other words, you've got weak, a flat Phillips curve means you've got weak medicine. And it's to me a little bit peculiar to say with very weak medicine, you should administer a tremendous amount of it. That's probably, in other words, when you think about sort of having a target, having a fixed committed target with weak medicine, you're sort of saying, well, the marginal benefit is low, but I'm gonna do a lot of it anyway. It's like taking a lot of Tylenol. It's like taking a bottle full of Tylenol when you've got a really bad headache, right? You wanna have no pain, it doesn't work very well, so you just keep taking more, okay? That is the right thing to do in the knife edge case where there are no side effects. But once there start being side effects, weak marginal benefit means you may not want to do as much, right? If the Tylenol is going to chew up your liver or your kidneys or something like that, you may want to go a little bit more gently. And so I think that's the possible concern. So if you worry about sort of long period of very low rates, um, creating sort of financial instability that can't be perfectly dealt with, with macroprudential or other forms of regulation, then I think there's a liver trade-off to be to be considered here, and you might want to have a somewhat more discretionary approach where you're opportunistic in your seeking of inflation, but you're not so committed that you'll do it independent of where markets are or where other considerations um, might be. So I think that's, that's sort of the essential trade-off. I think if you're a big believer that you can move the dial on inflation expectations and thereby get closer to your inflation target, you're going to like this. If you worry a little bit more about side effects uh, from relatively weak medicine, you'll be a little bit, um, a little bit more, a little bit more skittish. So I think I'm out of time, and I'll, uh, I'll stop here and turn the screen over to Sydney. Thanks, Jeremy. So Jeremy was talking a lot about the Fed. I think Sydney will still have Fed as main player, but I guess probably more focus on the stock market rather than the lending. Sydney, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Can you see the screen? Great. Uh, so Marcus asked me to talk about a few topics a day. I'll start with the behavior of the market in the early months of the pandemic and then go on to say a few things about the market more recently, um, the stock market specifically. You know, we really wanted to understand um, <clears throat> the, the sharp V-shaped trajectory in March and April of 2020. So let me just talk through a few of these bullet points on what we've learned. Um, you know, by February of 2020, as we now know, COVID-19 had set in motion this worldwide disruption in economic activity, causing the U.S. unemployment rate to reach 14.7% in April 
the S&P 500 initially reacted to news of the disease by losing 33.7% of its value between February 19th and March 23rd of 2020. However, the market then abruptly regained the vast majority of this lost value, rising 29% between March 24th and April 17th. That was a surge that left the index back where it stood in August of 2019 when the US economy was booming and the unemployment rate was 3.7%. So what could explain this sharp V-shaped trajectory of the US stock market that took place over a matter of weeks in the early stages of COVID-19? or in the early stages of when we understood it was a global pandemic. I explored um, this question and worked with an excellent doctoral student of ours at NYU, Josue Cox and Dan Greenwald at MIT. And to do so, we, we took a two-pronged approach. The first part of our study employed a theoretical model that I've used in other work of mine with Dan and Martin Letow at Berkeley Haas, along with some updated estimates of that model to decompose the market's changes into distinct component sources attributable to either fluctuations in aggregate economic growth, in short-term interest rates, in the corporate earnings share of output and or in discount rate fluctuations driven here by the pricing of stock market risk. And for that, you should think of changes in either risk aversion or beliefs uncertainty, all of those things that are orthogonal to these other component sources will get loaded into the pricing of, of stock market risk in our framework. Now, I won't go into the details of this model here, but let me just say that it is flexible enough to explain 100% of the change in equity values over our sample and over any specific episode with one of those component sources. And we estimate this model using uh, state-space methods and that allows us to precisely decompose the market's observed change into one of these distinct sources. Now to do this exercise, we needed a way to calibrate the size of the COVID-19 shock to output as perceived by market participants. So we consulted the survey of professional forecasters. This is a quarterly survey and the 2020 Q2 wave, which is taken in May, of this survey indicated that there was a huge revision in the forecast for GDP with a median actually now cast of negative 32.2% annualized growth in 2020 Q2. So that was a big revision from the, the Q1 forecast taken in uh, January, uh, excuse me, in February um, of 2020. So we took that as an indicator uh, of the magnitude of the shock, the annualized decline of 32.2% once converted to a quarterly growth rate in logs is negative 9.7%. So keep that number in mind. And then we modeled this as a shock to a first order autoregressive process to give it some persistence. How do we figure out the persistence of the shock as perceived by agents? Well, it turns out that the 2020 Q2 wave of the SBF also gives us a median forecast for annualized real GDP growth in 2020 Q3. So in May, that forecast was 10.2%. Now we can use these two forecasts, specifically the now cast for 2020 Q2 and the Q2 forecast for 2020 Q3 to solve for the implied perceived autoregressive coefficient um, early on in the pandemic and find a value of 0.74. Now this served as our baseline value. <clears throat> So with that, the model now fully specified, we can use it and the data to compute estimates of the part of the decline in the market. We'll start with just the decline part of the V that can be attributed to various sources. Okay, so keeping in mind that the market lost what is really an astonishing 33.7% of its value between February 19th and March 23rd, that translates into a log growth of negative 0.411 or log change. The punchlines here are that an output shock of size negative 9.7% for the quarter can account for a log change in the market of negative 0.0015, that is explaining a mere 0.37% of the actual log growth of negative 0.411. Even if we assume that the initial shock of the same magnitude were far more persistent than what an AR coefficient of 0.74 would imply, this mechanism is still unable to explain much of the observed decline in the market. So in the limit, a fully permanent shock could deliver a quarterly log change in the market of negative 0.097, which is just 23.7% of the observed decline. Now that those small contributions can be understood because even under permanent output shocks where shareholder payout, payout falls proportionally with log output, <clears throat> proportionally with output, 
once we fix the required rate of return on stocks, that the log decline in the value of the market can be at most as large as the output growth shock itself. Since the observed decline in the market between February 19th and March 23rd was 33.7%, while the expected quarterly decline in output for Q2 was only 9.7%, the direct contribution of changes in output alone to the observed market decline is quite limited. Now, we also considered what could be explained when we combine the same baseline transitory output shock with um, a decline in the corporate earning share of output of various magnitudes. And the bottom line here is that if you want to explain the full drop with these combined sources of variation, this would, would require not only a very large drop in the earning share, something we haven't actually seen in this entire recession for the S&P 500 earners, but also one that persists for decades. And that is just unheard of in post-war data. So taken together, these results suggest that economic fundamentals alone in the form of a large aggregate output drop, even one that's uh, realistically uh, calibrated to this uh, tremendous drop that we've seen, and even if accompanied by a sharp decline in the corporate earnings share of output, these are just unlikely forces for explaining the sharp declines in the market that we saw in the early months of the pandemic. And that really leaves only the pricing of, of equity market risk. Now, it is even more challenging to explain the market turnabout that began so abruptly on March 24th without appealing to large fluctuations in discount rates driven by changes in how risk was priced. Neither expected fundamentals nor the quantity of risk appear to have improved in late March. If anything, market expectations of the near-term future cash flows further deteriorated around that time, as we know from the work of Gormson and Koyan, who used data on dividend futures and we, we also have measures of aggregate uncertainty that sharply increased in March and remained unusually elevated by historical standards throughout April. Okay, so short-term interest rates, not a plausible candidate for explaining the drop, but they do move in the direction that could in principle explain the rebound. So we know that Fed actions brought the Fed funds rate to a range of zero to 0.25% by March 15th. Since our model incorporates interest rate changes as a driver of the value of market equity, we could quantify the direct effects of this drop in rates. And so, you know, let me just say that short-term interest rates have both lower and higher frequency components. Only the lower frequency components have the ability to explain big movements in the market. So let me just give you the punchline here. If we attribute all of the decline in interest rates in March to our estimated low frequency component in short-term interest rates, this would imply a log increase in the market of 0.0439, which undoes about 10.6% of the original market crash. It still falls fall far short of explaining the full recovery in equity values through mid-April. So unless um, some there's some movement in investor beliefs uh, associated, for example, with this interest rate change that would show up in risk pricing in this framework, possibly about the stance of monetary policy, I'll have more to say on that later, then we can't explain the dramatic V-shaped trajectory yet again. So we, we're just left with one other major factor that could explain market behavior, and that's discount rates doing the bulk of the work of the pricing of stock market risk. So the question then becomes, why did attitudes or beliefs shift so abruptly? abruptly? And the next part of our investigation explores the possible role of the Federal Reserve in, in some of this sentiment. So the first thing we did is use a high, fre high frequency event study of the stock market's behavior in the minutes surrounding Fed communications in March and April of 2020. Now, we were particularly interested in how announcements pertaining to new credit facilities that Jeremy talked about, designed specifically for this crisis, at least in principle, that were unprecedented in both scope and magnitude may have affected the market. On March 3rd at 10 a.m. and March 15th, 5 p.m., the Federal Reserve um, released FOMC statements outlining conventional monetary policy steps to address the slowing economy, lowering the target range of the funds rate, increasing its holding of treasuries and agency MBS. I'll just refer to those as conventional monetary policy announcements. There was then a separate series of announcements stating that the Fed would revive and or expand credit facilities similar to those created during the 2008 financial crisis. <clears throat> 
But on March 23rd of 2020, the Fed began the first of several communications on the creation of credit facilities that were entirely new to the COVID-19 crisis. These were designed to extend credit cor to corporations, to small businesses, to households, to state and local governments, and they went well beyond the 2008 playbook. There were numerous announcements and numerous facilities with numerous names. Let me just mention one here. The announcement on April 9th at 8.30 a.m. when the Fed announced that it would take additional action through many of these facilities to provide up to, quote, $2.3 trillion in loans to support the economy. Now, we're just gonna classify all of those announcements as unconventional monetary policy announcements. Um, what is immediately clear when you do the high frequency event study from examining all of those announcements, including the conventional ones starting in uh, April, uh, in March and April, is that not all announcements of Fed actions to address the economic costs of COVID-19 were associated with a rise in the market. With the exception of the March 3 FOMC statement, all of the conventional monetary policy announcements are associated with the decline in the market in the minutes immediately subsequent to it. In the case of the March 15th announcement, the lowering of the target range for the funds rate between zero to a quarter percent seems to have only amplified worries over the extent of the damage from the pandemic, according to news reports. Now, among the unconventional policy announcements, there are also at least four for which there's little to no evidence that they served as the impetus for a market rally. Possibly they were overshadowed by bad news about the virus um, <clears throat> or widely anticipated. But we did find five separate unconventional policy announcements in March and April that were associated with a rise in the market. Collectively, these five announcements are associated with gains of approximately 8.3% in the S&P 500, this is just through the end of April, and 12% in the Russell 2000 index. And among these, it's the communication on April 9th at 8.30 a.m. announcing uh, you know, these new facilities and expanding uh, previous announcements in which the Fed said it would take additional steps to provide 2.3 trillion in loans to support the economy through its newly created facilities. That is the one that has the largest effect. Now, with the benefit of hindsight, we can now observe how much credit the Federal Reserve has actually extended under these new facilities. And as Jeremy already pointed out, um, it's not a lot of money. So we referred to the Federal Reserve's periodic reports to Congress. One was delivered on August 8th of 2020 and again, December 11th. And from these reports, we can observe that as of July 31st, of 2020, the total value of credit extended under all new facilities was only 101 billion. The Main Street Lending Program, one of the many new facilities created, for example, had total outstanding loans of only 87.6 million, that's million with an M, even though the total value of collateral pledged to secure the loans was 37.6 billion. And by November 30th, the total value of all loans had shrunk to 86 billion with the Main Street Lending Program shrinking to 6 million. As we all know, the market has only continued to climb over the summer and fall of, of last year. So overall, what these results suggested to us is that the Fed announcements about new credit facilities specifically did play a role in the market turnabout, but somewhat ironically, it did not do so via a substantive extension of credit to support the economy. And there's little evidence. About five minutes. Okay. So let me, let me go on to um, the froth in the market more recently. What could possibly be going on here? Um, the markets have continued to climb and valuations are higher than they were immediately in the pre-pandemic period. Why, why should they be even higher now than they were then? Um, you can tell stories about why this might be due to uh, macroeconomic fundamentals, you know, the innovation boost, maybe that's part of it. But these would just be stories at this point. We literally have no evidence. Um, and it's going to take some time to get that data. But one type of data we do have are these recent announcements that we have been discussing um, by, by the Fed and others more recently. And so what I would contend is that one factor in the continued climb, likely of several of equity valuations over the course of this pandemic, is that the Fed announcements have increasingly telegraphed their renewed intention to remain crouched in an extremely dovish stance for an extended period of time of unknown Length. There was this notable FOMC press release in September 16th of 2020 that really crystallized this. 
Now, I just want to say this linkage that I'm arguing for, specifically between the stance of monetary policy and equity valuations may seem obvious to the financial and economic practitioners in the virtual room here, but it has proven exceedingly challenging for academics to accept such stories as plausible because it has been uh, unclear how such a pattern could hold up in equilibrium. So this is despite growing evidence that the real values of long-term financial assets fluctuate sharply in response to the actions and announcements of central banks. The central difficulty is that these findings create a theoretical conundrum. Asset pricing theories can only rationalize in general these responses if market participants believe that something related to the conduct of policy will have a very long lasting influence on real variables and then the notion that monetary policy shocks, which is what the literature focuses on, could have long lived effects on real variables is contravened by an, an agglomeration of foundational new Keynesian macro theories that imply that monetary policy is neutral except over the short term. <clears throat> so we can poke holes in these theories and let me just show you a plot. Um, I mean, this is exactly what I've done in recent work with Francesco Bianchi and Martin Lipta where we've looked at this. First of all, we would say that shocks are the wrong concept. One needs to look at shifts in the conduct or the stance of policy as measured in the models and in our model by infrequent shifts in the parameters of an interest rate rule, like a Taylor rule. And with that, you can be successful in understanding an equilibrium connection between equity valuations and monetary policy if the model accommodates two forces, sticky macro agent expectations about inflation, which appear empirically plausible on the basis of surveys of inflation, and revisions in investor expectations about the future conduct or stance of monetary policy. Now, these expectations can incorporate learning and something like a, a fading memory distortion, which helps explain the data. Um, investors spend enough time in a particular monetary policy regime, they start to view it as the new normal. And here's, let me just show you a, a, a plot here. On the left-hand side, we have a measure of equity valuation. Uh, I don't have time to go into this. this. is from an older paper of mine, it's updated. Um, it's something like total assets, but its volatility is driven by the stock market relative to macro fundamentals. We'll call that the wealth ratio. On the right-hand side, we have a series we call the monetary policy spread, and that is the difference between the real federal funds rate and a widely tracked measure of the neutral or natural rate of interest from Laubach and Williams. We think of this difference as a measure of the stance of monetary policy when it's large and positive, it's indicative of restrictive policy. When it's big and negative, it is indicative of accommodative policy. And we estimate regime switches in the means of these two series jointly. The blue lines tell us that there are large differences in the means across the estimated regimes, which we call dovish for the low MPS regimes and hawkish for the high MPS regimes. It's immediately evident that the equity valuations are high when the MPS is low and vice versa. And I don't have time to talk about this right at the moment, but you can observe phases of monetary history on the right-hand side across these dovish and hawkish regimes. Now let's, this is the last thing I'll say, I don't, before I run out of time here. The black line is the component of each series that we estimate in a model is attributable to solely to the regime changes in the conduct of monetary policy. Now, these are not shocks that we're measuring here. They are deliberate shifts in the stance of policy. If you just focus on the left-hand panel, we see that shifts in the stance of monetary policy are associated with lower frequency movements in valuation ratios. And they match well um, the movements in equity valuations over the post-war period. Um, that are these conditional mean movements in, in this uh, valuation series. Dovish policy coincides with a low MPS and is associated with high equity valuations. That's where we are right now. And hawkish policy is associated with low valuations. And by the way, these uh, estimates imply much longer departures, though not permanent, from monetary neutrality than canonical New Keynesian models. So let me stop there uh, in the interest of time. And we can talk about other things later if we have time. Thanks a lot, uh, Sydney, for giving this perspective on the stock market. Um, probably there will be a lot of questions. I would like to invite everybody to submit questions in the Q&A box so we can move to the next phase of the next presentation. And I forgot to mention uh, that the AFA climate survey, uh, if you haven't filled it out yet, uh, it's a good time after the session to fill it out. So for the American Finance Association is conducting a survey and you probably got some emails. It would be great to submit your answers.
With this, let me move on to Nick. Nick will change gears, I guess, a little bit talking about innovations and working from home and what will last after the COVID crisis. Will we shift to a new regime after Sydney talked about some monetary policy regimes? Nick will talk about uh, different uh, regimes after the COVID crisis as well. Nick, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, Marcus. Ah, uh, let's see. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try, after your encouragement, the beta version of sharing my slides as a virtual background. Let's see how that goes. Um, okay, so um, this is, uh, I should point out, this is joint work with uh, Jose Barrero and Steve Davis. So, you know, I'm going to talk about working from home. It's probably impossible to have... Uh, not notice that working from home has exploded in the US media. So here is US media coverage of working from home. It was pretty flat uh, until 2019, just before the COVID crisis. It's hard to see on the scale here. This is the number of newspaper articles in US newspapers that mention the word working from home. And it was very low. Uh, there's a couple of spikes. Here's like Marissa Mayer. I don't know if people remember, but back in 2013, she talked about banning it in Yahoo. And it was like the uh, the biggest media coverage she had, weirdly enough, in her career at, at Yahoo, and I think in general. And then more recently, uh, uh, Rand Paul and Mitch McConnell were both injured in kind of weird incidents in August 2019. But you can see working from home has like, exploded in media coverage. And now at the peak, like one in every 40 articles was talking about it. So I'm going to talk about kind of past, present, and particularly future of working from home. Just to, just to set the scene, what did we know before COVID? Um, so before COVID, what we see here is data from the American Time Use Survey. They ran a survey of in 2017, 2018 of around uh, 10,000 working Americans. And you see that the percentage of people that work from home you know, only 15% of people ever work from home full working day. So, I'm, you know, I know lots of people work, you know, mornings and evenings. This is a full day because we want to think about things like commuting and office space. So only 15% of people before the pandemic ever work from home at all. And you notice most of them are, I know, probably like me and most people listening was pretty occasionally only 2% are doing what's very common now, which is full time. So before COVID, full time working from home is very rare. During COVID, this has completely exploded. So I've been running surveys of two and a half thousand working Americans a month. In fact, a couple of months, we've done 5,000 to soup up the sample size. Here's May. Uh, if you go on the left of May, what you, we sample Americans aged 20 to 64 that earned $20,000 or more last year. So these are people this year you'd expect to be working. On the left, you see actually in May, 42% of people working from full time. So that's gone from 2% to 42%. So that's what a 20 fold increase, an enormous increase. 33% um, of people are not working, which you know, tells you at that point how bad the collapse in the labor markets were. And actually 26% the smaller share working on business premises. We go forward to December, the most recent data, working from home has dropped a bit, but not much. I mean, it's dropped 5% and uh, not working has obviously dropped the labor markets recovering a bit. But even so, you know, working on business premises is still about equal to working from home. And as I tell you in a minute, people working from home are higher earners. So the share of GDP, if you weight it by earnings, is still the majority is coming from working from home. So in some senses, an amazing fact is, you know, the COVID pandemic has seen the majority of GDP in the US come from working from home. So if you told me this, you know, nine months ago, I think you'd be crazy to predict it, but it, it's come to pass. So, you know, before I, I'm going to be kind of very positive on working from home. Before I do that, I want to point out I'm aware there are some pretty awful challenges under COVID. So working from home under COVID is horrible for lots of reasons. You know, everyone's cramped. They're sharing rooms. The broadband doesn't work. They haven't managed to get enough equipment. Uh, on the left and the middle is pictures of a couple of Stanford students, you know, struggling with various issues. Scarlett on the left shares a small apartment with her uh, husband and they had to rotate. She got mornings, he got afternoons in the shoe cupboard. They were both on the conference call. They, she said they closed the doors. So the only way to get enough soundproofing. Nikhil in the middle is in his uh, girlfriend's walk-in wardrobe. And on the right is my uh, four-year-old, now five, I guess, under, you know, she's through the pandemic. But anyone with kids, which is roughly half of the labor force, uh, is understands how hard, uh, how this is, particularly the young kids, I think. My favorite story is uh, someone, a friend of mine told me that her husband zooms from their crawl space, which was like fantastic. 
he's a teacher and said the only way he can get enough quiet in his house with their young kids running around is to go like to the minus floor. Uh, so I, you know, I wouldn't want to try it. My crawl space is pretty dirty, but that tells you how desperate people are under COVID, uh, given everyone's at home to get some quiet space. So what about our numbers? So I'll tell you about the survey, what we find in the future of working from home. So uh, this, this number's already out of date, actually. It's uh, 22,500 workers. We've been serving between 2,500 to 5,000 workers a month. Uh, as I mentioned, they're age 20 to 64. They earned $20,000 or more last year. So basically, you can think of these as, you know, full-time employees last year. You'd expect them to be pro pretty much all of them to be full-time employees this year. Um, you know, it's so a standard internet survey, nothing particularly remarkable. Um, here's our response rate versus the current population survey. Um, we do a pretty good job. This is an internet panel. It's not totally representative. What we do is we reweight by earnings industry and census division to match the CPS. Even without reweighting, we're pretty representative. And once we've reweighted, we match very well. On the bottom is things we don't uh, explicitly reweight, but again, they align. We align very well on education, age, gender. I, I don't want to claim it's perfect, but it, it, on observables, at least, it looks very similar to the US uh, population. So what do we know? So here's the current state of working from home, according to our survey. So, uh, you know, much like inequality, working from home can be measured in many different ways. It's, it's, it's much more multidimensional than you think. So I'm going to now use a different measure. It's going to be my primary measure going forward, which is the share of paid full working days that are work from home. So this is on the y-axis. Um, before COVID, that's 5%. Where did I get that number from? That was from that American time you survey bar chart I showed you early on. If you take the 2% of people that are at home full time, plus 0.8 of the people that are at home four days a week, plus 0.6 of three days a week, et cetera, you get up to about 5% of working days. So before COVID, 5% of working days, full working days were at home, 95% were on business premises. So some, but a very small share. In May, uh, you know, that, that was the first wave we ran that exploded uh, to over 60%. So the majority, and certainly when you wait it by income, as I show you in the minute, higher income people, college graduates, et cetera, more likely to work from home. So by income, that was about 75, 80%. So the huge majority of people working from home, probably pretty much everyone listening to this, um, it drops back down. It actually has risen back up again recently with the second wave and the renewed lockdown in the US. So we're still at more than 50% of working days in the US are working from home. You know, a couple of things to point out that's notable just digging into the numbers is one is education. So not surprisingly, if you look at education levels, educated people, people with a college degree uh, or, you know, a PhD like for half this audience um, are working from home. There's a much lower level of people with less than a high school degree. Why is that? Well, you know, it's kind of related to the work of Dingle and Neiman and many others that if you look at the types of tasks that all of us do, you know, educated people, it tends to be more computer based stuff, more office based work, the kind of things that can be done remotely. If you look at, say, people that have less than a high school degree, you know, they probably left school at 16 or maybe they're immigrants that didn't have much education in their home country. They're much more likely to be working in factories and shops doing manual jobs so that it's far harder for them to work from home. So I'll come back to this later, but there is a big education and therefore income divide, and there's a, a major issue around inequality. The other thing that's interesting is politics. So, you know, in America right now, politics pervades everything. So on the left is working from home by red and blue states in May, and on the right, it's in by November. On the left, what you see is blue states were more likely to work from home in May. Red states were more likely to be working on their business premises. So back in May, partly because the pandemic was worse in, you know, particularly eastern coastal states, blue states, Democrat states, they tend to work from home more. Partly, I think, because they're, you know, they had lockdowns earlier. Maybe they believed the lockdown message. Interesting enough, by the time you go to November, you notice that red states are actually higher in their working from home share. Not a lot. But, you know, you can see it in the data and statistically significant. And it's not the case that in November, their lockdown regulations are higher. They're still looser. I, you know, the only in inference you can draw is the infection rates were so much higher in red states in November. People were voting with their feet. So, you know, there's a whole debate about how much of 
behavioral change under COVID as regulations versus as, you know, Mark has talked about it, kind of perceptions and behavioral change. This looks like at least working from home, a chunk of it is driven by people's fear of getting infected if they go to work, whether or not their state forces them to. A lot of people, particularly in red states, have just chosen to work from home. So what about the future of working from home? Um, what do we predict, you know, linking up very much with Jeremy and Sydney, what they were talking about, kind of looking ahead in asset markets, I'm going to look ahead in, a, uh, in kind of labor markets, working from, or, and to some extent, property markets. So before I show you this on the, uh, what the prediction is, why don't I point out one thing that maybe isn't too apparent, which is people have very different preferences on working from home. So in economics, you know, I get the impression that many goods, most people have roughly similar preferences. There's certainly not the heterogeneity you see here. So here we ask people, how many days a week would you want to work from home post pandemic? And it's, you know, it's not quite, but it's kind of close to a uniform distribution across all the different options. So 11% of people never want to work from home post pandemic. They tend to be younger, single uh, living in small apartments in you know cities, they're like I don't want to spend any more time than I need to in my apartment. I want to get out. I want to go to work. It's you know it's lively. It's social. I want to meet my spouse, etc. Um, on the other extreme, there's 27% of people that want to work from home five days per week. Uh, they tend to you know they tend to be a bit more like my demographic. Although well, it's not me to be honest, but they tend to be like my demographic, older, uh, with kids, you know, married in a house. You know, I personally, and in the, in the median person is somewhere in between. Uh, I like going into work. I like seeing my colleagues, but I could happily have a couple of days a week at home. So three days a week, you know, in the department, teaching seminars, meeting speakers, et cetera, would be great meeting students. Uh, two days a week at home. A lot of meetings you can do now anyway, very effectively one-on-one. -on -one. And it turns out that's kind of the average for the US economy. And as I come to it in a minute, if you're an engineer and you're thinking about minimizing, you know, loss squared, it's kind of where many firms are thinking of. So I don't know how much you followed the media, but it's very much becoming the consensus now. You know, I had to say personally, from having worked on working from home from you know more than ten years, I uh, had various academic papers on this. You know, back in the 2010s, um, I've spoke to a lot of execs. I don't know, a couple of hundred people since the lockdown, probably. And the consensus is, you know, crystallized what Google put out last week, saying. Post pandemic, we're going to have people come into the office three days a week and work from home two days a week. So, for example, whole teams are going to coordinate, but you're going to come in on, say, Monday, you know, Tuesday, Thursday, week one, and Wednesday, Friday, week two, and we're going to rotate. And this would match very much with what the average person wants. So, then what are firms planning? Well, here's this graph. We've added one more point. We've asked employers what they're what, you know, what, what firms have told them and remove the people who say don't know. You could also set that to zero. There's not a large share by now. We also separately the Atlanta Fed and Chicago been running a survey of firms directly. You get very similar numbers. So what's going on here? It's very easy to explain what's happening here. So there's two figures to have in mind. One is in the US, about half of people can work from home. They have jobs that basically allow them to work on computers, to work at distance. Under the pandemic, almost all of them are currently working from home. The other half of them are kind of factory retail jobs. They cannot work from home, are not doing that now, and aren't going to do this post-pandemic. So half of people can work from home. Currently, they all are, five days a week on average. Post-pandemic, the stories we're getting out is they are going to work from home two days a week, come in the office three days a week. So, you know, if you have... Uh, Two days a week of half the population, that gets you about 20% of days. And that's almost exactly what that point is. So you should think of that post-pandemic, what the main adjustment's going to be on the intensive margin. Everyone that's working from home now is going to remain working from home post-pandemic or more or less everyone, except rather than doing it five days per week, they're going to do it three days, uh, two days a week. And that's where this drop comes from. Very little drop at the extent of margin. There are very few people in the surveys that are working from home full time now. The report planning to go back entirely post pandemic. Or this or report actually what their employers have told them, more importantly. So, why would this stick? I'll go through this quickly, but you know, there's five reasons. One is stigma. Before COVID, there was massive stigma. Uh, I gave a TEDx talk on working from home in 2017, and I used this screenshot from a uh, Google search, or I think this is Bing actually, but you can see I punched in working from home images and it's like super ne negative cartoons, naked people, you know, nothing very positive here. If you survey people, their responses has been the stigma 
the negative stigma against working in primary has almost completely vanished. It's seen as you know neutral, if not anything, if not positive now. Secondly, uh, it's kind of like an example of the two-armed bandit problem in economics. A lot of firms had never tried it out. They didn't know how it would work. We've been forced to do mass experimentation. Uh, both you know, firms have experimented, some like it, so they're gonna stick. That's the classic bandit result. If you try stuff out, there's a variance of outcomes and some people find it's good and they stick. It's also the case that on average, working from home has turned out to be much better than people thought. And so that's a second reason. Productivity has turned to be far better than anticipated. Thirdly, there's massive investments in enabling working from home. So from the survey, we estimate uh, about 13 hours and about $600 has been spent by the average person on getting this to work. Think of Zoom, getting Zoom, you know, whatever else, you use Teams up and running and figuring out how it works. Uh, you know, I spent a couple of hours trying to work out how to get, you know, after Marcus's encouragement to get yourself to like be the weather person in the bottom right corner. Um, and so collectively, it's about one and a quarter percent of GDP have been invested this year by households. There's a similar amount being invested by firms. So here's the data from Fred on firm investment. Uh, and all, every, category invest, every category of investment in the US is down except this one, investment information processing equipment and software, which is massively up. And again, it looks like it's firms investing and working from home. So Nick, you have about four minutes. Great, thanks, Marcus. So fourthly, uh, much like working from home is not gonna go away. I don't think fear of crowded spaces and density is gonna go away. This is a picture of the uh, original sneeze video. This is actually the, visit, the uh, photo from the Arctic in Pilos in 2013. I put this up because this is an old photo, but you've probably never seen pictures like this until the pandemic, at which point now everyone's seen dozens of these horrifying sneeze videos. If you ask people, about their residual fear of proximity post pandemic, uh, over 70% of people say they will be nervous going back to crowded subways, elevators, you know, many people say far worse. So I don't see everyone happily rushing back to getting back into skyscrapers, et cetera, uh, post pandemic because of fears of, you know, other, vac other diseases, people that refuse to vaccinate, et cetera. And then finally, you know, a fight, fifth sticking factor is directed technical change. So here's just a share of patents in the US Patent and Trademark Office that um, have mentioned working from home. It's kind of related, I think, to Sydney briefly mentioned earlier about an innovation wave. It's hard to know that's true on aggregate, but it's certainly, as she said, you know, but it's certainly clear that at, around working from home, there has been an innovation wave. There's been, wave. There's been an explosion of patents on this. So to sum up, what are the implications? Um, one is a huge increase in inequality. So working from home is a great benefit. On average in our survey and on prior work, people report that working from home two days a week is equivalent to about an 8% pay increase. That's a, a large amount of money. But if you look at who's gonna get it, if you, this is a graph of working from home days per week, 40% is two days a week. The black dots is who wants it. Everyone wants it by income level. If you look at who's gonna get it, basically the wealthier people. I mean, most of the people on this, call of probably at this end are likely to get to work from home. So if you're earning $200,000 or more post pandemic, you're happy, you'll get your two days working from home. If you're earning 20,000, you want two days, you're gonna get more like half a day on average. So that's, it's a benefit, but it's very unequally shared. Secondly, it's a big killer for city centers. And I won't go through the numbers, I'm out of time, but we estimate even post pandemic, it's gonna cut retail expenditure by about 10% in the center of large cities. Here's Manhattan, we have very good data on this. It's generating what's, you know, I, I please say Mark, Mark is used to saying donut photo idea. Maybe it's, you know, getting people hungry at this time of the day, but it's what's been called the donut effect. So what we see in the data is people moving out from the very center of cities out to the suburbs. So no one is leaving particularly New York for, you know, firms and I don't seem to be leaving New York or San Francisco or Chicago, but by allowing people to come into work three, maybe even two days a week, a lot of individuals are moving out from the center to the suburbs. So from Manhattan to the Bronx, from downtown San Francisco to East Bay, et cetera. And it's pushing down property prices very clearly in the center of cities, but up in the suburbs. And then finally, I think this is potentially a big boom for productivity. The productivity numbers we get from working from home are kind of plus I mean, it's a big range, I could get into the details, but they're positive, they're kind of plus maybe five, 10% if you're able to come into work two, three days a week because you need some FaceTime, but some time per week is best. 
uh, you know, alone. So working from home is going to, you know, has exploded. It will drop back, but it's not going to drop back nearly as much as pre-COVID. Marcus's QWERTY point, this is, you know, a change that's going to stick. Uh, and I think it has massive implications for uh, quite a number of things in uh, US and international society. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Nick, for giving us this perspective. I think it affects all of our lives and uh, let's see uh, how we will live and work uh, in the future. So I would like to open it up. Uh, There's some questions in the Q&A box. Uh, perhaps we can work through them first. And then uh, if you have more questions, please raise your hand and I will uh, give you uh, the, the microphone in, in a virtual way. Uh, but keep it short and just to the point. Uh, so if you raise your hand, uh, I will pass it on. But let's uh, move to some of the questions. Perhaps I project them out and then uh, you can answer them. So one is uh, David Smith was asking, uh, uh, you know, this copper bond bubble, is it because there's this large amount of dry powder even before the crisis? So I would like to throw this to Jeremy. And uh, there was this increase in savings. So where does the savings go? Is it primarily because people now can't spend? There's forced savings and they have to park it somewhere. And that's why we see uh, this huge uh, copper bond bubble uh, coming up. And, and the second question David Smith has as well was about the break-even inflation. Should we trust the the tips uh, break even point uh, from projecting out the inflation in the future. So let's see, I, if I take this question to be about the decline in credit spreads prior to the pandemic, sort of why we had relatively narrow credit spreads, I suspect um, that a lot of it has to do with the so-called search for yield. Um, you know, I, I, uh, if you think about, for example, an endowment or something like that. You know, all of us have universities with endowments and we'd like to see them continue to pay out the same amount to the faculty, uh, you know, to do that as interest rates get lower, as risk premia get lower, they sort of take more risk. And so I think that that's at work. And this is, I, th I thought Sydney, some of the, the, the last picture that Sydney showed was fascinating for the following reason. If you try to see this effect in high frequency data, you know, you can imagine sort of doing something where you say in the, in the immediate aftermath of an FOMC announcement, if there's a surprise easing, do credit spreads narrow, you know, in the next 24 hours. You can see it, but it's not very big. And if you think about the theory of it, you wouldn't expect it to be very big immediately because how does this sort of search for yield work? You know, there's investment committees and eventually after low rates have been bearing down on them for a time, they think, well, we have to switch our asset allocation, what have you. So I thought what was fascinating about Sydney is it's, we should think of this much more, not as sort of high frequency responses, but as regimes. And you know, in a regime, so you know, I, I don't know what happened when the Fed made various announcements about QE3, but if you look at the QE3 era, you see a steady grinding down of credit spreads. And so you know, it's harder to do the causality there, but looking for it, you know, looking under the street lamp of sort of high frequency event studies isn't going to find it if it is there. So I think some kind of a lower frequency approach of the sort uh, that she was describing seems like the way you want to think about this. And so that's, that's sort of my, my strong prior, but, you know, I would be a little bit more ginger on, on sort of, you know, how strongly I'd assert the causal case. Let me move to uh, Sydney. We come back to you, Jeremy. There's some more questions for you as well. But uh, uh, Ehud, uh, Ron asks about, you know, when you do your analysis, to what extent you take into account that the stocks essentially are levered positions, uh, you know, taking a firm is issuing a lot of debt. So the stock itself is levered. And uh, some other question which came in is that um, you studied, you, you mentioned the Taylor rule, but, you know, when we have all this unconventional monetary policy, would you um, extend the Taylor rule to have some, a broader perspective, uh, you know, taking risk premium, other elements into the Taylor rule or more generalized Taylor rule. Do you have any thoughts on this? Um, yeah, thank you for the questions. So let me start with the last one first. The, the Taylor rule, um, so right now there are various parameters in this rule and um, a lot of um, unconventional policies will get loaded into some of these parameters. For example, the inflation target in this model is not literally a target, but it would, um, it, you know, it moves around as across the dovish and hawkish regimes. That's what we estimate. 
and it would incorporate um, everything such as um, uh, large scale asset purchases or forward guidance, these kinds of things would get loaded into that target um, in the absence of, of having additional factors. You could of course think about expanding the rule to, to somehow account for these additional factors. Um, but, but right now it will get accommodated through these other parameters as well. Now on the, the leverage, absolutely. Um, I should just say that the model that we use um, prices the enterprise value quite well of, of in the data. So um, it, it results in similar, similar findings. I don't think leverage is, I should also say that we do have a, a um, leverage in the in the model. Um, we allow for a form of operating leverage that uh, markets indeed respond more than the earnings fundamentals in our model, and that's part of the reason um, uh, you know sh shocks to earnings in our model do do have uh, larger effects on on valuations. But it's really hard to see how leverage um, can explain the the. The V, you know, the, the turnabout. Um, there was a crash and an abrupt um, change back, and it's that change of direction I think is just just very challenging to explain. Thanks. Um, so again, we we'll come back. Uh, submit your questions. So if you want to speak up, please raise your hand. Uh, let me ask Nick about some questions which appeared uh, by anonymous attendee and by Bradley Carp. Uh, one is like. Uh, you mentioned the stigma as being very important. There was this huge stigma with working from home, which is now lifted. Are there any other stigmas you see in the real world, which are out there and COVID has lifted, or we could lift like business travels and all this, you know, necessities of business travels. Now you might have a negative stigma making a trip across the globe and ruining the climate um, just for a, one hour a meeting in Singapore, or wherever you are on the other side of the globe. Is there, is, do you see other, uh, stigmas out there or stigmas evolving uh, because of the COVID crisis. And the second question was about learning from home. Uh, what's your prediction about this? Will there be more going on, piano lessons and other things, learning from home from somebody, you know, teaching from the other side of the globe uh, at home? Or do you think it will be more person to person? There will be the pendulum will be swinging back that people will be so eager to meet the teachers uh, in person rather than uh, through Zoom or Microsoft Teams. And more generally, do you have any predictions on, on university education? Will we move to a hybrid model? How do you envision the university education down the road? Uh, I'm sure I like every parent is straining to hear the, <laughs> the answer to university education. Um, so I'll start first on stigma. I mean, it's very, it's very interesting. It's very non-economic, but it comes back. I mean, it's the theme of this session a lot of these things you know as, as through your comments and Jeremy and Sydney a lot of these things are kind of expectational behavior almost but um, yes I mean and, and that, two other angles I've seen just we ran a survey with the Atlanta Fed and the University of Chicago about business travel by firms and firms forget now everyone knows business travel now is like zero more or less but we asked post-COVID when there's a vaccine what would you see happening to business travel and it's down 40 percent so we asked about 2022 so you know next year onwards and then we had a follow-up question about share of meetings, external meetings in your firm that will be done online. Pre-COVID people reported it was 15%, post-COVID they report 50%. So I think, well, you know, everyone has the same view, but it seemed as much more normal to meet suppliers and finances. You know, I have to do jury service in about a month. I've been called up and that's gonna be remote. So that would be unthinkable, uh, you know, nine months ago, a year ago a bunch of that will stick. So it's pretty clear firms expect to see business travel way down. And that's why airline stocks and leisure stocks and, you know, are really not recovered that well. So another area is teaching. I mean, morphing into the second question. I have four kids. I live out in California. They're all Zoom schooled at home. Uh, does it work? It would be much better for them to be there in person. But I could see impossible in future doing one day a week at home depends how far you live. It's certainly the case that schooling from home can work in a kind of imperfect sense. So I would say the quality of Zoom school is 60% versus ex ante, I might have thought it was 20%. And 60% if you're, you know, you don't have access to a good school. For example, on, you know, schooling, I could easily see American schools taking on students from abroad that have no physical access to anything remotely good. So imagine you live in you know, a, a pretty poor developing country, you're schooling 
is is truly awful. It may be much better to Zoom school in somewhere else. As a university, my experience is teaching. I mean, everyone has probably had the same experiences. Teaching to large classes is not great on Zoom, but one-on-one -on -one meetings with students has actually worked pretty well. Uh, so again, I think there's a whole set of changes that's going to happen. Uh, I think it's much like the work. I don't think we're going to have a bang bang situation either way. We're going to go post COVID to much more online activity, but far from 100%. You know, we're zero before more or less. We're 100% now. For those of us that can, we'll maybe go to 20%. So there'll be a lot more activity. You know, just to give you one example, we're having a discussion. I think Sydney was on this call. There are a whole bunch of us with the MBR about the future of economics conferences. And, you know, some viewers, it may work to have some of these. Uh, remote, uh, mostly in person, but you know, once a year, some of the sessions to be remote because Zoom's conferences have worked a lot better than we thought. So let me just add one question to you, Nick, uh, which comes from Jackie Lane. Uh, are there any negative externalities from working from home? Can you elaborate on that? So that actually it's bad, which, we do, which people don't internalize. They like to work from home, but now it's actually it has negative externalities on others. If the others stay at home, you can't. You have to stay at home at two. You're sure, three. there are two negatives that come up. Uh, one interesting, I, I talked to a lot of execs, and weird enough, we're on Zoom. I spoke to the person that's the CEO of Zoom, and one of the negative externalities that came up there was about you know innovation and creativity. So there is no hard and fast data on longer run productivity, but the idea here is, it, you know, a lot of execs say it's hard to be creative. As an academic, I actually work better probably over lunch, you know, meeting people and having discussions against a whiteboard. So if we're at home five days a week, I think creativity is going to be down. And most views are that we should get people back into the office three days a week. So that's one negative externality. I'd say the research base on that is kind of light, but I think the consensus is pretty strong. The other that I have much stronger evidence is, is I did a randomized control trial on working from home in China back in 2010. I won't go into the details. I mean, the paper came out in the QJE a few years ago, but uh we randomized people and you discover people working from home their promotion rates almost halved so there's very clear evidence if you're in a team where half the people are in the office five days a week and the other half are in the office one day a week which is what our rct was if you're in the office one day a week your promotion rates almost half now one reason is you're forgotten about that's a big neg negative externality that's like discrimination against home-based people the other story is all that lunch times and coffee breaks that you're not productive in the short run, you're actually building long run human capital and bonding and you know, managerial know-how. So, you know, I don't want to claim all the chit chat in the office. You know, I talked about football much more <laughs> in work with my, you know, my European colleagues that follow the Premier League than I do now. But some of it was definitely intangible work stuff. And I think we're losing it. And that's why I mean, come back to the consensus is we will be back in work three days a week because we need three days a week of face to face time. We probably just don't need five. So you can argue that, you know, not talking about football is a negative externality to your friends as well. Uh, let me move to the next topic. Uh, probably Sydney can uh, uh, jump in on that. It's about Bitcoin. So you were, were evaluating stocks. Would you have expected similar relation effects on Bitcoin? And is this a signal of future inflation? That's um, uh, one question which came up in, in the chat box. Uh, do you have a take on this? I know it's a little bit distant from what you presented, but Perhaps you can speculate you know, on the Bitcoin uh, bubble. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, I, I don't know how much I want to speculate on one particular stock like Bitcoin. Um, but I, you know, I do tend to see some of Jeremy's point. I, it resonates with me that there's some uh, reach for yield going on here and just pure speculative activity. You know, we saw that. We see that a little bit in the IPO uh, frenzy. Um, you know, we didn't have time to talk about that, but um, the, the dollar value of what's been raised, not the number of IPOs, we looked at the data a little bit um, before this talk, but the, the number of IPOs is, is not nearly as high as it was in the late 90s, but the dollar value raised is really high. And, um, you know, that, that's related to these, these SPACs. And uh, the question is, um, you know, without them, we, we wouldn't have an IPO frenzy at all. Um, and so it, it strikes me as sort of a similar flavor. Um, the, many of these SPACs have not even merged with, um, with a company yet. So uh, they've just raised a bunch of money. So 
That, that strikes me as somewhat speculative and that may be what's going on with certain stocks like Bitcoin. Thanks, Sydney. There's another question coming in for Bavik Parak, Parik uh, on uh, pension funds investments. And perhaps I can throw this at Jeremy. Uh, uh, do you see pension funds investment strategies changing very much towards uh, non-conventional investments like infrastructure development, green energy, because of this low interest rate environment and because of some inflation risk and all that? Do you see um, that changing because of COVID or more generally because we live in an environment of a low interest rate and pension funds have to have a high enough return? Yeah, I mean, this, this is sort of what, what I was alluding to before. And I, you know, I don't want to overstate the evidence on this, but my prior would be, and it's not about the um, it's, it's not about the pandemic particularly, but if we have, as Sydney was alluding to again, a sort of sustained, very accommodative, low interest rate environment, there are there are a variety of agents who have effectively these part this sort of target like behavior, right? Where you know the Harvard endowment we seek it's very explicit we seek to earn a 5% real return so that we can continue to pay out 5% uh, uh, to the school. Well, think about what does that mean? You know, if it, it was re relatively easy to achieve a 5% real return when you know, safe real rates were two to 3%, now they're somewhere in negative territory. Um, so, you know, basically, I think if you look at the asset allocations of endowments and pension funds, you see some general push out the risk spectrum, whether it's allocate, you know, just higher beta, whether it's bigger allocation to private equity or the hedge funds. So I suspect that, you know, there will be that continued pressure as long as we remain in a, in a low, rate, um, low rate kind of environment. And we don't have some kind of reckoning of, of one sort or another that, you know, that sort of you know, pops, the, pops the bubble. So Cindy has a follow-up question on that about the international equity and corporate bond allocation of mutual funds and hedge funds after COVID. Do you see a big change uh, because of COVID? Do you think that's not necessarily that the equity funds or corporate bond funds internationally reallocate differently? Um, I, I really don't know. I, I just think some of these things, the jury is just out and we're going to have to see you know, what the data tell us over the next several years. I mean, uh, there's, there are a lot of uncertainties about what even the fundamentals for many of these claims are going to look like. Um, as you alluded to, Marcus, in your talk, they could be improved, actually, um, if, if certain sorts of um, creative destruction or, um, you know, in Nick's talk about the, the you know, realigning of the workforce. Um, but at the same time, you know, we, we, we just have um, these, these scarring potentials. And so I, I put that all in the mix and, and I'm not entirely sure, although I do think this perpetual low interest rate environment is, is, is going to, you know, cause some shifting in funds towards possibly more risky assets. Thanks, Sydney. So let me move back to Nick. There's another question on small retail businesses operating in affluent city centers. So we know from work by Raj Chetty and others that, you know, if you are a poor person in an affluent neighborhood, you suffer the most because rich people just move out from, you know, upper side to, uh, New York to Hamptons and so forth. And if you're providing a small retail business in these areas, then you suffer a lot. Do you see some in the long run, some migration from low income individuals out of these neighborhoods and hence the quality of living there is actually deteriorating then for the rich as well. Uh, how, how would you characterize the different regional impacts beyond the donut effect? Um, I generally think it's probably positive. So just to be clear, we know there's been, you know, David Alter, in fact, last, was it last year, the year before the American Economic Association, his presidential address, he showed how, if you look at 1980, rich people didn't live in the center of big cities. You know, I remember going to visit McDonald's and Times Square in like 1980s, the tourists, and I noticed they had security guards with guns. It was such a, you know, central cities were dangerous, scary places, whereas by 2019, the most expensive real estate in the world, more or less, is in like central Manhattan. Um, so what we see in the data, and I've been looking at the z tracks data, that's the Zillow. I have a student working in the Arjun Romani who's been looking at the z tracks data. You see um, 
that both commercial and residential prices have fallen quite sharply in central business districts. So it's not only uh, commercial property, but it's also residential property have become a lot cheaper in the center of cities. How far this will go, it's like unwinding of the city boom. We're gonna go back maybe to 2010, maybe 2000. Um, and you know, spending and everything's moving out to the suburbs. In terms of the impact in inequality, that's making it the city centers more affordable. Living out of Silicon Valley, and you know, probably for Sydney and you, you know, and all of us really, there was the big issue about hiring faculty. Silicon Valley for Stanford is no one can afford to live here. And if the property prices in particularly downtown San Francisco, but the valley drop a bit because people are moving out, that actually makes it easier to get people in. Now, if you think of who most needs to live in the center of cities, it tends to be service, lower income service sector workers. You can't work from home. Investment bankers don't probably need to live next to Wall Street if they can work from home three days a week. But people working in pret a or coffee shops really do because they can't do that remotely. And often what happens, they live in horrible accommodation. So I actually think we're going to go back 10, 15 years and see more low income people actually moving back into the center of cities and more higher income people moving back out to the suburbs. And that's actually one of the upsides, I think, of the pandemic, the central cities become slightly more affordable and they don't become so much, you know, I guess enclaves of the elite. I mean, this has become political. Don't, you know, my politics, don't get me wrong. I'm, you know, I, I don't want to be political on this, but there is a, an attack from the right about, uh, you know, effectively segregation by income into city centers. And this will slightly unwind that, which I think is healthy for kind of mixing up society more as well. Thanks. So let me jump around again. Uh, so John Ward would like to know from Jeremy, you know, what are, what do you think, Jeremy, are the most important side effects from low interest rates? Uh, and um, um, so I guess we've sort of been over this uh, to some extent. We've talked about the search for yield. I guess one other thing that hasn't been talked about, which is, but which I think is kind of an interesting thought, um, is the idea of you know, the, the, the sort of the general heading of all this might be, are there any reasons why there's sort of an undesirable side effect from keeping rates too low? I think again, we covered the sort of financial stability effect. The other is this sort of idea of using up your ammunition. Um, now, this is something interestingly, if you think about the sort of standard classical macro models, they don't have a using up ammunition type of thing. That is to say, it, you know, all you need to know for sort of, you know, summary statistic for, for the stance of monetary policy is current and future policy rates, okay? But that's essentially because those models don't have something in them that acts like a durable good. So think about what happens in a world, and you can do this with investment or you can do it with durable goods, but think about a world where there's durable good consumption. So people buy cars and refrigerators. Well, think about what happens if you try to stimulate the economy today by keeping rates very low. Well, one of the things you get to people to do is to basically bring forward their purchases of cars and, and uh, refrigerators and things like that. But of course, if they've got, if everybody now is an important state variable is not only the future path of policy, but how new is everybody's car and refrigerator, right? And once everybody's got a new one, they're less likely to buy one going forward. So the past history matters and past ease basically lowers, you know, we've talked a lot about low R star. Usually it's talked about as if R star is an exogenous thing that has to do with demographics or technology. But a low, a period of low rates can in fact in this durable goods type of world, lower uh, R star going forward endogenously because basically once you've brought forward all this stuff, you're gonna have to keep rates even lower and essentially, you know, do even more to stay, to stay in place. So. Another reason, and by the way, I, I, this is, this is I'm, I'm sort of drawing on work by um, uh, uh, Veland and McKay on the one hand who talked about this, this channel and my colleague Ludwig Straub who's also done some work on this. But it has sort of the interesting caveat, I think, that you know, there's again a bit of an intertemporal trade-off if you burn a lot of your ammunition, let's say in a period of low unemployment just chasing inflation back up, you know, from 1.7 to 2, you might be less able if another recession comes along, to, especially when we're kind of crowded by the zero lower bound, you might be less able to do something when, when we need to do, you know, something to, to deal with uh, another, another recession. So again, this is in the general kind of category of side effects and why you might not want to just inelastically 
at all costs chase um, chase sort of a two percent uh, inflation thing. Now, I think th this sort of idea is pretty clear conceptually. I can't speak to sort of its empirical magnitude, but I think it's a very very interesting idea that sort of deserves um, deserves some further uh, thought. So this reminds me a little bit also of the research, which is about refinancing mortgages. I guess there's also some post dependency out there. Yeah. It's another, it's, a, it's very much in that same category. Um, so the, another question about, you know, you talked about, like the analogy very much about this weak medicine and drinking too much Tylenol, I mean, not just taking, but drinking it essentially. And uh, what are, so actually we should look for different medicines or so not just having Tylenol, should we look for different medicines or just take less Tylenol and be a headache? Uh, do you have any thoughts on this? And then there's, um, the question by anonymous attendee would like to know whether one of these medicines might be helicopter drop and we do it with PayPal or Venmo accounts. And uh, do you have any thoughts about these type of measures? Or so is like the $600, $1,200 or even $2,000 talked about, is this a helicopter drop already in a sense? Yeah, so let me, I think these, these questions all kind of go together. Um, you know, first of all, to be clear, the Fed cannot do it is not monetary policy to do a helicopter drop, okay? A helicopter drop, and the way to think about this is, you know, decompose it into two, two pieces. First, the fiscal authorities, the only, the only ones who have the legal authority to do this, can make a payment, you know, to households, a tax cut or a transfer payment of whatever, financed by issuing treasury bonds. The Fed can then buy those treasury bonds and essentially monetize the monetize the debt. But of course, they don't have, the, the Federal Reserve does not have the authority to make payments to the households. So it's an essentially fiscal, what we're calling a helicopter drop is an essentially fiscal action. Now, you're, it's absolutely right that if you find yourself in this box, if you just say, here we are in a low, you know, in a ZLB kind of environment, and if you just tell the Fed to solve it, um, I think you have these inevitable trade-offs, right? In other words, they can try to be more aggressive on inflation, but they're gonna inevitably court some risk of financial stability. I think the, the natural thing to do is to say, what else can you do? And I think the, the what else that, that, that is you know, often discussed is fiscal policy, right? So if we try to essentially stimulate the economy or try to you know, raise inflation and we do it with fiscal policy, that doesn't involve having rates be so low. And in fact, you can sort of support a higher R star with more aggressive fiscal policy, um, and so that kind of gets you out of the box. Now, I wanna be very, very careful. As a positive matter, as a positive economics matter, I think it's right to say that if you do more aggressive fiscal, you, know, you don't have to have rates as low and you'll probably have less financial stability risk. As a normative matter, you gotta be a little careful. It's not, it does not follow that you wanna do helicopter drops, even if I, you know, because there's some cost, obviously, uh, you know, you're making transfers and you're using up fiscal capacity. So I don't think it follows, but I think one certainly wants to think about fiscal as part of the mix and then weigh it with whatever considerations you would normally, what, you know, things like infrastructure spending uh, tend to look good, obviously, purely on capital budgeting grounds in a world of zero real rates. Um, helicopter drops are more complicated because then you're basically redistributing. Um, and that you have to weigh that sort of against its, its, its own set of uh, uh, criteria. Thanks a lot. So Sydney, let me jump on you. So I would like to move a little bit into the cross section of stocks. I mean, you talked a lot about the overall stock market, but we saw in particular large firms and tech firms uh, benefiting this time huge amounts. And look at Tesla moving up 600% and other tech firms benefiting big time. Um, if you look inside the whole stock market and, and to, to see a phenomenon there showing up, can you say anything we can infer from that, small versus large firms? And when you go a little bit more behavioral, people talk a lot about the narrative of missing out. So many people think that, you know, the 2008 crisis was a big crisis, but the stock market ultimately did fairly well. And now there's a narrative out there. If, you, if you're not in the part of the stock market, you miss out. Uh, like the second time around. So you have to be part of the stock market. And that's why the stock market is doing so phenomenally well, despite the fact we are in the deepest crisis uh, since the Great Recession in terms of uh, initial shock. Uh, can you elaborate on this uh, going beyond into the stock market and different in the cross-section essentially? Yeah, 
Yeah, well, I, I mean, I no doubt that there are these sentiments. I, I feel like I myself miss out because I, I worry too much about the effects of these big economic shocks on my... But you can work from home. That's a big plus you have. Um, you know, I, there, so one of the things I think, and, and, and I'm just going to just talk off the top of my head here because I haven't done any formal work. And I think, again, I, I still think it's going to take us some, some years of data to collect, to understand exactly what's going on. But I do think there are potentially sectoral shifts going on in these shocks. You know, I mean, this, this shock is obviously a big redistributive shock, um, it just randomly took uh, a chunk of the resources in the economy, gave them um, to a bunch of firms that were well positioned to um, effectively, through no fault of their own, profiteer from the pandemic and took from other types of firms. And so those kinds of redistributive shocks are, um, are interesting. And, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, market has been increasingly concentrated, uh, the value of the market in the, in, in the hands of a few big tech giants already before the pandemic. So this shock, uh, which, which clearly benefited them, um, you know, uh, at the expense of other companies in the indices um, is probably m moving the market along uh, somewhat in, in and of itself. But I, I, you know, I think this is a very interesting uh, idea and, and topic. And I, I, my, my sense is, I mean, it's something that I'd like to look into more. But if you go back and look at the uh, 08 crisis and the aftermath of that, you will see that that also was somewhat redistributive. Um, and along the way, it seems that the evidence suggests we're, the economy is becoming um, less competitive. And, uh, you know, that could also be playing a role. But I do just want to go back to my earlier point that both, I mean, you know, the, the, according to our estimates, and if you look at this monetary policy spread, it has been low for the entire post-2000 period, except for this brief um, two-year period when the Fed raised rates 17 times right before the financial crisis, um, and then they cut them right back down. So we have been operating at a very, um, basically, I'm looking at the figure, a negative monetary policy spread. That is, even with this, you know, tr strongly trending down natural rate, and of course you can take different measures, but it, they're all just trends. The Fed's uh, rates have been much lower than that. And that's, that's going to affect discount rates. And uh, these are very persistent effects. Um, it, it's really hard to see any other um, contribution other than up for asset valuations when you have uh, those kinds of persistent effects. As I said, we also found some evidence consistent with the idea that investors, um, you know, they maybe don't have such perceptions of long horizons. They maybe extrapolate a little too much from the observed continuity in these uh, policy regimes. And they're constantly trying to read the tea leaves through these announcements about, of the Fed about where they're going next with the stance of policy. So um, I also, I just also, believe that that's playing a role. It was playing a role after 2008. I think it's playing a role now. And then in the mix of that, you've got these interesting and potentially extremely consequential shifts in the composition of production going on and the composition of value in, in the stock market. Thanks a lot. So uh, I think we end the final few minutes. So if everybody wants to react to somebody else's uh, comments, please uh, do so. Uh, let me throw the mic to Nick with two questions. One is, uh, after 9-11, everybody was expecting that people move out of the inner cities and uh, you know there will be a donut effect as well, but it didn't come. Exactly the opposite happened. What went wrong in 9-11? Why should it be now different? And, uh, and the second aspect is, uh, perhaps you can elaborate a little bit more about uh, the regulatory changes which came and you know if we think about telemedicine and all these things probably was very difficult to imagine that all this regulation which suddenly were lifted uh, will they come back or do you think they are lifted for good and uh, we have opened up now telemedicine and other aspects and other regulatory hurdles which we faced before COVID they will be gone for good and we have a totally new regime. Sure. So, um, I mean, 9-11 is a good analogy that's come up a lot. It's true if you look at travel, 
airline flights were down for three years. They didn't recover back to their prior level into 2004, and that was against a rising trend. So on certain things, we measure very well, like, you know, flight traffic, we see it. 9-11 was, was nothing in scale of impact on society compared to COVID. So 9-11 may have had an impact. The problem is, you know, you're trying to, the steamroller was, you know, urban growth and uh, you've, you know, thrown something in front of it, but it was hard to tell whether it slowed the steamroller down. But COVID is just a different magnitude. I mean, you, by the way, just to be clear, you're already seeing it. So rents just on market figures, the Zillow data, you already see the prices of commercial property transactions in the center of cities down and rents way down. So rents in San Francisco are 30% down below the pre-pandemic levels. They're currently at, 2011 levels. These are not small numbers. Uh, I've actually spoken to quite a lot of commercial property developers. It's commercial property sales have collapsed and there's a lot of subleasing going on. So commercial property market is doing really badly. So I, I don't, I mean, this is not just a prediction. This is a realization at this point. Um, and then the other question, oh, I've forgotten. What did you ask? I'm sorry, this is the uh, pandemic. Uh, the COVID removed a lot of regulatory regulations. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, this is another great example of why, you know, across the road, my neighbor, uh, Jenny, and she is a, uh, a doctor, and she was telling us that now, because they changed insurance regulations, you can now uh, pay people back for televisits. They're doing a huge number of televisits. And I'm guessing for many people here, it's the thing you want to do. I mean, actually, it takes a lot of waiting time. I think there's an MBR working paper on this. It just came out, but it's very slow going to see the doctor in person. You're sitting around in the waiting room and you've got to drive and park. And so personally, there's a bunch of stuff I could just do remotely. So that's a big, in, you know, that's honestly a productivity improvement and that's going to be here to stick. There are other crazy regulations before the pandemic. You had to be certified in state and you could only treat in state. So imagine you're a Delaware doctor. Why can't you treat someone from five miles down the road from a different state where you couldn't and now that's changing. So this is, you know, a bonfire of, to be honest, some of it unnecessary regulation. So I would like to come to a close because we will be shut off automatically in about one and a half minutes. Uh, but I would like everybody, would like to thank everybody for being on the panel and giving such great insights on this important topic and uh, also for all the participants for participating. I would like to use the last minute if anybody of you would like to say something. There's still one question to Jeremy from Roberto about uh, various shocks, the supply shocks, demand shocks and uncertainty shocks, how to put them together and how to, you know, what shocks are the more important ones. Uh, if, but if anybody wants to like to react on somebody else's talk on uh, quickly uh, open the floor. Yeah, otherwise, anybody, otherwise I throw the microphone. I'm keen to hear from Jeremy on that. As guess is Sydney is, I don't know, so. Well, Sydney can jump on this too because exactly. he worked a lot on uncertainty as well. And, and Nick too, so that's essentially a common theme. Everybody works on uncertainty and time yeah, I, I, I don't know that I can say anything useful in whatever 40 seconds, but you know, I think the COVID itself was a simultaneously massive demand and supply shock. And if you think about something like inflation, you know, the question is whether one is 10X and the other is 9X or the other way around. And it may well be that these things operate differently at different frequencies. That is to say that in the short run, the demand effect was stronger than the supply effect. So it's somewhat deflationary, but that could certainly reverse um, going forward. I think I better stop here because there's 15 seconds. Thank you. Sydney, do you want to use the last few seconds? <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I don't really have anything great to add on that. It's really hard to identify these different shocks. So thanks again to everybody and uh, hope to see you in the real world soon. And bye-bye, um, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have a happy 2021 <laughs> and a healthy 2021.